Hope everyone enjoyed the break. Uh, as I was saying um, before the break, each presenter will have uh, 10 to 12 minutes for the presentation. Then the committee members will have roughly five minutes to ask the presenter questions. And their biographies, as I said, are on the ASPE PTAC website, along with other background materials. So presenting first, we have our previous submitter representatives representing the capable provider-focused payment model. We have Dr. Sarah Santon from Johns Hopkins School of Nursing and Dr. Kendall Cannon from the Stanford Clinical Excellence Research Center. Sarah and Kendall, uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much and thanks for having us this morning. Um, we've been asked to talk about the ways in which capable reduces disability, improves social determinants of health and saves costs. Um, next slide. So I just a quick start with a capable participant who was 75 years old, who had had a stroke and had diabetes. Um, and before his stroke, he loved to bicycle and that's how he stayed in shape. Um, and was told he couldn't bicycle anymore. Uh, he also had a lot of difficulty bathing and so um, didn't bathe, uh, except for just a little bit at the sink. He was a duly eligible uh, gentleman. Um, next slide. And um, I could talk for an hour about him, but, but uh, sh shortly, um, we, Capable has a nurse, an occupational therapist, a handy worker, and the older adult. And uh, the handy worker made a, um, his bicycle into a stationary bicycle for him so that he can bike for an hour a day just in his house um, and put up banisters, as you can see here, and um, situated the bathroom so that he could um, take a bath. So these several things, being able to get up and down his steps, being able to take a bath and being able to bike puts this kind of a smile on his face. And of course was good for his diabetes and not getting another stroke. Um, next slide, please. Um, so capable as mentioned is a nurse, an occupational therapist, a handy worker and the participant. And the, um, the innovation in terms of what, why we're here today is that um, it addresses social determinants of health that matter to the person. So um, what both the nurse and the occupational therapist do is assess the older adult and the person's environment around what would they like to be able to do. So it's not primary care, it's kind of foundational to primary care. And what they would like to be able to do is often circumscribed by social determinants of health, like being food insecure or not being able to take a bath or not having, um, you know, having the boiler break or other things that matter for being able to um, have a, a meaningful life that keeps them out of the nursing home and the um, hospital. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so Capable's home base. So you see all of the challenge someone's up against and it's convenient for the older adult. Uh, it's built around their own goals and building their self-efficacy. And that is, you know, decades of research about self-efficacy and how to improve it and how important that is for future challenges. It's an integrated team. And then importantly, um, generates, generates data that advanced payment models can use um, to address social determinants of health and health equity. Next slide, please. Um, sorry, the font is, is light on this, but the idea, and I know you'll, you'll have the slides, is that capable is really different in several ways, different compared to your typical disease management intervention. So it's not about a particular disease or risk factor like falls or congestive heart failure. It's designed to maximize independence around what the older adults care about, whatever it is to them. If it's getting to their mailbox, if it's being able to get out their back stoop, if it's being able to bathe or get up and down their stairs. Um, and we've shown um, with 10 years of evidence that decreases hospitalization and nursing home admission. Um, rather than being provider driven, rather than you should do this or you should not do this, it's completely around what matters to the client. So in the case example I gave, you, you know, none of us, if we saw him in a um, clinic room or a hospital would say, oh, I bet you'd like to bicycle more and let's brainstorm ways to do that. He said this is what matters to him and we figured out how to make that happen. Um, and rather than being focused on narrow risk factors like just home safety, for example, it's focused on the fit between the person and the environment. And that's what's 
uh, essential. And, and the, the environment isn't just are there holes in the floor or are the cabinets too high to reach? It's also the, sh the social environment um, and the financial environment. And these are all layers of the social determinants of health. Um, and for most kind of disease management or risk management um, for patients, the, the benefit goes away once the program goes away, but capable of self-sustaining because of that building, the self-efficacy, teaching someone how to brainstorm a new problem. They often call us after the program is over with, oh, I had a new problem and here's how I brainstormed about it. Um, and of course, the changes to the home are sustainable as well because they're, you know, part of the the walls and the floors. Um, next slide, please. Um, CMS evaluators showed that Capable um, reduces per member per month costs by, by $918 over a two year period. And uh, it only costs $3,000. So it saves about seven times what it costs on average. And this is because disability is under assessed, but a big driver of costs of hospitalization and nursing home admission. Um, next slide, please. Um, so modifiable disability, as I just said, it's highly predictive of, of the next year or two's cost. So it's, you're not catching people who are already high cost spenders. You're catching kind of the rising risks, people who will reliably be costly. Um, they're identifiable with the right data, such as asking people about if they have difficulty with bathing or dressing. It's underutilized questions that really pack a lot of punch in terms of being able to assess addressable uh, disability. And we've shown that it's treatable. On average, people reduce their disability, cut it in half. And this has not just been in our research, this has been in multiple other sites in rural and micropolitan and metropolitan areas. Um, there was recently a new paper published um, of showing um, of all the studies of capable, um, the same findings that we have had. And capable is now in 45 places in 23 states, including in some advanced payment models. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so you asked for suggestions about data and APMs and health equity. And um, would just like to answer that the number of older adults with disabilities living at home is growing. We've seen through COVID how important it is to be able to stay out of institutions for older adults and their families. Um, and we know how to, how to identify people, when to intervene and help payers get ahead of the curve on physical function. Um, next slide, please. And um, just a little plug for physical function is um, mostly ignored and it's the ultimate health equity indicator. If you think about it, people's, um, you know, whether at 80 someone is speaker of the house or dead or has multiple chronic conditions, some of it has to do with genes, but a lot of it has to do with the life that they have been able to experience during those 80 years. Were they food insecure? Did they get the education that they needed? What kind of jobs did they have? And uh, we have a chance as a nation to address um, decreased physical function due to health inequities. And just as one stark example, a 70 year old who's food insecure, meaning that they don't have enough money for food or they have skipped a meal in the last month, has the physical function of an 84 year old. So there's a 14 year difference in if you're food insecure and your disability. And with programs like Capable, we can uh, decrease the disability. We can also treat their food insecurity. Um, only 50% of older adults who are eligible for SNAP, which is food stamps, are on it. And it's very simple to sign them up. So this kind of standardized tailoring of assessing what matters to people and then not just referring them to programs the way some social determinants programs do, but actually enacting them with them and, and helping them um, be able you know, to understand how to move forward with other problems is a really important way of addressing health equity. Um, I think that's our last slide. And um, do you want to just click to the next one so we can see? Yeah, so we've got some supplemental ones for questions and answers, but we'd be really honored to answer any questions that people have. Great. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, committee members, questions? So, Jeff? Yes. I have a question. Sure, Jay. So, what's the workflow for how people get into the program? Is it, you know, you do a data screen, claims based? I'm, I'm just really curious as to the operational workflow. 
how people get into the program? Sure. So um, claims are really under document physical function loss. It's often not assessed partly because it's not necessarily billable for. So claims could, is one way, but you you'll miss a lot of people that way. So the annual wellness visit has questions about um, functional disability, like ADL activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. So asking someone is actually the the simplest way, and and you know to get everyone that has an annual wellness visit to you could um, you know send them towards capable. But um, ideally, you know one of my last slides was about the the ways that the National Quality Forum and CMS are moving forward, trying to put um, physical function as something that needs to be assessed, and and um, ideally that would be in claims, ultimately, but it's not currently. Sarah, um, I have a question about, um, you know, a lot of the information you get to directionally focus your efforts is direct questions, surveys, that kind of instrument. I'm wondering if you've had or have experience or planning to get experience with predictive analytic engines that can use a whole, um, you know, a variety, I guess, of data types and give you some better insights into which populations you want to proactively reach out to. Right. Um, so that's a great question. And some of the um, bigger partners that we're working with will be doing that. So I'm a, I'm just a pointy headed researcher at Johns Hopkins and um, the, the, you know, we're working with village MD, which, you know, is opening up uh, 2 health clinics a week with Walgreens currently. Um, and they, they've integrated capable into their home based primary care. They are exceptionally wonderful with, um. This kind of predictive algorithm. So we're going to be learning a lot from them. Some of the bigger, bigger and more regional MA plans are just starting to do capable. And so I think that will be the next phase. What you're talking about, both in terms of predicting who would benefit, and um, maybe there should be some tiers of like full capable, which is ten visits, or, or sort of a kind of capable light for people who might need a little less. Great, thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Angela. Well, you asked the question I was going to ask, so, but I, I have another one. So, and, and um, I can't remember from the first time you presented to uh, PTAC, the, the nurse that's involved in the program, uh, other than doing the capable functions, does, does she also do an assessment and work with uh, other care managers or bring community based organizations to the table to help with other identifiable issues? Um, yes, so thank you for that great question. Um, it's, it's all very flexible. So the, the assessment for that the nurse does is about the person's pain, mood, strength and balance, um, connection with their primary care provider, do they have one, um, and medications, but, and falls, but based on what the person's interested in. So they may say, I don't really know what my medications are, but my daughter fills up my pill box and I don't want to work on that, but I do want to work on pain or I do want to work on depression. Um, but in the course of working on those, uh, the nurse, she or he will often identify some of these other issues that um, they then refer back to kind of the care management of the primary care practice. And we now at Johns Hopkins, since, since Capable started at Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins physicians um, using our um, all payer hospital model, the hospital pays for Capable out in the community to try to improve the health of the community and decrease preventable hospitalizations. And we hear routinely from primary care teams, um, physicians and nurse practitioners, how valuable it is for them to get that information back, that looping back from the visit in the home, assessing those needs. That's one of the things I find most interesting in terms of the capable model is twofold. One, that the nurse is not just a typical skilled nurse that goes out and does, you know, medication management or, uh, uh, refers to X, Y, Z, it is this incredible kind of assessing what is important to that person. And by doing that, you end up with a much different uh, focus. And then the data that comes back to the clinicians is extremely valuable in terms of what, what can I do as a primary care clinician or as an internist to help improve their overall outcomes. Thank you for that. Great. Um, any other questions? This is Josh. I had a question. Uh, thank you for that presentation. I really uh, appreciated kind of the um, kind of how the um, <clears throat> self management activation related to um, individuals engaging in these parts of their care. And I'm wondering, you also presented a slide about um, the kind of cost reduction 
Um, where did you, if you, to the extent we know this, where have people found the cost savings? Is it related to, I think you mentioned avoidable hospitalizations, is it elsewhere? Is it multiple places? We fascinate to learn more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what we have found, and this has been um, duplicated, is that um, the nursing home, the, the reduction in nursing home admission is enough to break even for the program, but it's the hospitalizations because in a typical year, an older adults much more likely to be hospitalized than be in a nursing home. There's a lot more room to save there. It's also in specialty care um, savings. The, the only place where the cost went up slightly was in um, home health care, and we think that's probably appropriate utilization, some probably home PT and maybe some home OT. Even there's an OT in the model, the OT is much more about this problem. So it's not like so-called skilled OT. So we think that that's probably useful, um, uh, you know, changing in resources, but it's mostly the hospitalizations and nursing home admissions. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question, if I may. Um, how commonplace is it in your experience that provider based organizations support a program that results in less usage of their facilities? And when you say provider groups, do you mean you're talking about like a hospital or? or most likely hospital, but it could be a, an organization that includes both um, hospital and nursing. I see. Um, right. And so sometimes, you know, when I've talked to a hospital, they'll, they'll say, Un unless you can help me shut down a whole unit, you're not really saving me money if you, you keep people out of here because we still have the same staff and the same overhead and all. Um, so it's really more savings for Medicare than for the hospital usually, ex um, except for um, if, if a, you know, if a hospital is on the brink of needing to build a new one, they do a lot to try to keep um, utilization down. So I think it, it really varies. All right. Um, Sarah and Kendall, thank you so much for initially submitting your proposal for consideration and also coming back and presenting and speaking with us today. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you. Yep, thank you. You bet. We're really hopeful that we think this really fits in with what CMS is trying to do in terms of health equity and, you know, preventing disability and hopeful that um, it will spread more. So do we. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so now we have uh, Dr. Jacob Ryder who joins us from Huddle Health in the Healthy Alliance IPA. Uh, Dr. Ryder, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go off script a little bit and offer some context, especially in the context of, of what we just heard and, uh, and even uh, carrying forward from a question that Bruce just asked, because um, I think it hits to the core of what our organization did and perhaps uh, will continue to do. So when I speak of our organization, the core organization that I'm gonna describe here is an organization called Healthy Alliance IPA, which is a daughter of uh, Alliance for Better Health. Alliance for Better Health is a, um, an organization that was created in 2015 as a product of the 1115 waiver uh, that was granted to New York in, in 2014. So uh, that was the uh, so-called DISRP uh, program, delivery system, incent uh, delivery system Reform Incentive Payment Program. Uh, and that, that, that waiver was 2015 through 2020. Um, Alliance for Better Health and Healthy Alliance IPA persist, even though that program is gone. And I think that, of course, is, it is and or was the intent was to initiate programs and then carry them forward at the end of the program. So for those who aren't familiar, the, that program um, was aimed at reducing preventable Medicaid utilization by 25% over the, over the course of the program um, statewide in our region. And I'm, you know, I have a slide about our region, but for uh, in advance telegraphing my pass, it's the capital region of New York, which is Albany and six counties around the city of Albany in, in the capital region of New York. <clears throat> and so I uh, took over the organization 
uh, after it was about uh, two years into the five-year project. And much of what I'm going to describe is the evolution from its first two years, which um, perhaps by, through no fault of, of the, the leadership, um, we're following a model that looked to primary care to solve social problems and to look to primary care to reduce preventable um, Medicaid uh, utilization, ID, uh, primarily uh, acute care facility utilization, because of course that's where most of the cost is. Um, and so I'm going to use my props now. So I'm a family doctor, um, and in fact, the majority of the first two years of focus was, hey, let's get the primary care clinicians engaged. Let's get the hospitals and emergency departments engaged. And to Bruce's point, um, let's cause them to participate in reducing their volume of work. Um, and the, the challenge here is that most of that work was and today remains fee-for-service work. So we're asking organizations to reduce their revenue um, for X amount of dollars in exchange for losing, you know, X times three amount of dollars. So the economics, um, candidly, did not work. Um, they they would they you know when their CFOs got involved, um, they did the math and again you know without without throwing anybody under the bus, we found that the care delivery organizations could not be sufficiently motivated to reduce their fee-for-service volume. So what we did is we took off the stethoscope. My daughter is a social worker, and I started to listen to the people around me and uh, engage the community in working hard to address uh, the needs of the community that were upstream. And so now we'll, we'll, we'll fly through this, the slide deck. Um, Next slide. So what's the secret to a healthy community? Next slide. Well, obviously it's kombucha. Next slide. Or perhaps it's not. Is it a hospital? And what we learned is, sure, hospitals are important um, for managing illness. But in causing health, hospitals are actually not all that useful. Next slide. Um, is it these folks who you will obviously recognize as physicians and nurses and again, in general, we, this group, um, are trained to be reactive. Um, we are, in general, not trained to be proactive and think proactively about maintaining health. We are trained to respond to disease and treat illness. Next slide. And, and so our people's products and processes, as they say, the three Ps, are all focused when you look at the workflow of of a traditional primary care provider or a traditional hospital, um, that's what you'll see. You'll see re reactive and responsive. And again, this is not anybody's fault. Um, you know, as they say, right, some of my best friends are doctors. So what we're gonna talk about briefly today is that achieving better health is our shared commitment to the communities we serve. Physicians are not the answer, right? We are part of managing the challenges that we face. Hospitals are not the answer. Change is hard. And information technology is important. So we'll go to the next slide and I'll sort of power through most of these things. So we view healthcare as first, just as the HHS style guide defines, um, it's two words, not one. And we actually changed the name of our organization from healthcare, uh, uh, Alliance for Better Healthcare, one word, to Alliance for Better Health. Um, for very obvious reasons to me, but perhaps those reasons were not obvious to those who initially named the organization because we do not see health and care as synonyms, right? We see them as very separate things. And if we focus on health, we think we've got things prioritized properly. If we focus on care, then it's, a, it's about us and our, you know, continuing to feel useful in the universe. I'd love to put myself out of business. Um, and if we can achieve that and accomplish health, then great work. So we view, and this is obviously not a, a, a slide that most have never seen, social health, behavioral health, and physical health, and they are in this order intentionally, right? So if we can achieve social health, then most likely behavioral health will be built or maintained. And of course, with those two, physical health is much easier to build and maintain. Next slide. So 
we, we sometimes talk about upstream and downstream, and I want to be explicit about what we mean. We mean upstream, the social challenges are things that are upstream. And when people fall down the cascade and when their social challenges are not addressed, then it's very predictable that behavioral health challenges are going to occur and perhaps as a byproduct physical challenges. Now, this is not to say that people don't have physical challenges that are unrelated to these other issues, but it's very common that these other issues are in fact causal factors in physical challenges. Next slide. Uh, so I'm going to talk some about how we did what we did and in fact are still doing what we are doing. Next slide. Um, so this is the laundry list and you're not intended to, to um, take notes and read it all, but you can see that these are many of the issues that were presented to us um, as essentially a menu. Like what, what are we going to do? And as they go and say, as the saying goes, um, if you chase two rabbits, you will catch none. And so what we needed to do was <clears throat> focus. Um, next slide. Uh, I'm a doctor, not a social worker. Next slide. Um, but we needed, to, we needed to learn some of those skills, as my eye-rolling daughter would remind me. And so working with social workers, working with public health researchers, working with uh, community-based organizations after extensive work and needs analysis and um, deciding, you know, essentially what was best in our wheelhouse. The, these are the, the domains that we selected to initially fund and initially participate in. So food, um, housing, transportation, and a SERPA program, I'll describe each of them briefly. In the, in the food program, we partnered with a food pantry network um, and we assisted them in participating in a closed loop referral platform, which we implemented throughout the community, where we asked uh, food providers to um, uh, provide us with uh, data on screening for other social determinants of health to the individuals that they were serving, and then to assist us in identifying which were the needs that the folks that they were serving wanted to also get assistance with. Um, with the, and, and in so doing, by screening for other problems, we addressed those other problems and then were more proactive in connecting people to services that uh, they otherwise would not have been connected to, do, to. We also did some food as medicine um, initiatives that probably time won't permit me to go into detail too much. With housing and respite, um, we funded the creation of and now maintenance of a facility that partnered with regional hospitals and um, placed homeless individuals into the respite. These were individuals who were not sick enough to be in the hospital, but not healthy enough to be homeless again. And we found that this uh, did an incredible job at preventing uh, readmissions within 30, 60, and 90 days by getting these folks into sort of a, uh, a middle ground position and then they were actually placed into long-term housing uh, when they more fully recovered. It was it's staffed with uh, one nurse full-time, 16 beds, a fairly low cost facility that had extraordinary ROI both for the hospitals and preventing 30-day readmits, but also the, for the community as a, as a whole. With transportation, we provided transportation to individuals for non-medical uh, uh, activities such as going to the pharmacy, going to the supermarket, going to the uh, library to do job searches, uh, and so on. And we reasonably sure that that also had ROI. Uh, in the SERPA program, we funded a certification of certified uh, recovery peer advocates who could assist people with substance use disorder, primarily people who uh, were having challenges with opiate uh, addiction uh, and again found significant reductions in uh, preventable emergency department utilization. Next slide. So this is our region. I promised a slide with who we are and so have it. Um, next slide. Um, and so this is a, a brief summary of the closed loop referral project. Um, what we did was we empowered the community and implemented a program that now over a hundred organizations, both medical 
community-based organizations, uh, some faith-based organizations are using. And so everybody has a common screening tool. Everybody has a, an ability to both identify and act on the results of that screening. And I think it's the acting upon that's important. Um, and we'll see a little bit later some of our thinking around, around how it is that we need to act on the work that we do. Um, but it's, you know, we've seen the studies that, that lament the, the paucity of screening for social determinants of, of health, uh, especially in medical facilities. And our observation was that, well, if you can't do anything about it, don't screen for it, right? This is why we don't, you know, we teach medical students not to screen for brain cancer um, because the cost benefit ratio isn't, isn't all that good. Um, and so medical providers especially um, haven't had the ability to act on uh, the results that they achieve when uh, they provide social determinant of health screening. So we think that this kind of resource is imperative um, to have before one implements a screening program. Because if we screen and we can't do anything with those results, then our, our, our um, passion for that screening will be rather rapidly reduced. Next slide. And so uh, what we did after implementing all of this, next slide, was to watch. Um, and so we watched very carefully. In fact, we watched the screening uh, initiatives and then we watched the sort of bouncing ball of the referral as it passed through the community. We actually have four individuals who are monitoring at all times. Um, every referral from any provider in the community to any other provider in the community, either social to social, social to behavioral health, behavioral health to medical, and you know all, all of the above. And so we watch what happens when referrals are completed and or not completed. Um, what's fascinating to me is that we started in many communities, and we're actually working in other communities in both northern New York and now assisting providers in central New York. When we've started initiatives, um, when we started ours, our, quote, success rate was somewhere on the order of 40%. And that's very similar to these other two communities that we've both been working with. An A plus is actually more like 75%. So that means still 25% of referrals for whatever reason are not satisfied. Now, sometimes that means that, um, sometimes that means that uh, we uh, don't need to, to, to satisfy the referral because the needs have been met in some other way. Um, next slide. Uh, so the big question here is, do social interventions work? Next slide. The way to do that is to look at the data. Next slide. Um, so in order to do that, we acquire information. You've heard me describe that. We aggregate it into a data warehouse. We analyze it using NERDs and some tools, and then we act on that data. Uh, and the actions actually uh, cause another wave of acquisition, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the data that we're looking at is the acute care utilization. So as we see that fall, we actually can adjust our fall or not fall. We can adjust our actions in so doing. Next slide. Um, so what we've observed is that when initiatives occur in silos, this is my attempt to portray that, so that's a hospital and or a, a health plan. Um, when a health plan tries to do something all by itself, um, we find that things don't work at all. So a, a community-based organization might be even Velcroed to a health plan, and then they need to either provide easy pass service to their members or um, to not serve other members. So depending on your insurance card, and we've seen this, you may either get food or housing, but not both. We don't think that works at all. We've seen similar initiatives with hospitals. So next slide. And so we view the way that this works as a set of social needs. Next slide. I'm going to power through to get. Uh, uh, we need to identify them, we need to understand them, and then we need to act on them. Next slide. Our goal, of course, is to create the IPA that spans the community, that's a horizontal resource, next slide, uh, that addresses all of these things, right? Social behavior, primary specialty, acute, and medications. Notice that the stuff at the bottom is explicitly at the bottom, and we want to focus first on the stuff that's at the top. Next slide. 
And so we view what we're doing as a public utility model. We, I have never seen a health plan lay claim to a fire station or a street light, uh, nor have I seen a health system lay claim to a, a sidewalk. Um, and so we view what we are doing as something that should be agnostic to uh, where the funding comes from so that everybody can benefit. Next slide. And so we see this as roads or next slide, telephone poles or, and next slide. In so doing, we wanna make the right thing to do. Next slide, the easy thing to do. Last slide. And that we think is the secret to a health com healthy community. I will end there and take questions if there are any. Great, thank you, Dr. Ryder for that excellent presentation. Um, do we have questions from the committee? Uh, I have one. This is Bruce. Um, uh, before, I, I do appreciate your data and IPA images. Um, they didn't go unnoticed, at least not by me. Um, so now back to the, the hospital CFOs. Um, is there pushback uh, from the provider organizations as you achieve a certain level of success in your communities? Um, no pushback. I would say um, I, I would say the the most significant um, response has been acquiescence, right? Um, they're they're interested in what we're doing. Um, you know, these remember that physicians in general are benevolent human beings who want, right? Who want what's best for people. Um, so so they are not pushing back. Uh, they are allowing this to go forward and in some cases embracing it where they see ROI for them. So the respite is an example where they're reducing 30 day readmits and because of the penalties from CMS, this is a good thing for them. So where there's aligned business incentive, this is a good thing. Um, where there's not aligned business incentive, it's been, I, I would say um, an, an uphill uh, activity to get them truly engaged. Um, now, having said this, three of the five parent organizations of our entity are hospital systems. So, um, you know, they, they have supported this and it's the individuals sitting on our board who in their benevolence and in their fiduciary duty to help our organization succeed have literally taken off their home team hats and have made decisions that align with what's best for the community rather than what's best for their financial um, perseverance. Thank you, Angelo. Yeah, could you speak a little more about the actual screening tool itself? Are you using a standard screening tool or have you modified or come up with your own tool and uh, talk about that a little bit? Uh, no modification at all. The community agreed to use the prepare tool. Uh, oh no, wait, I lied. It, it changed a few years ago. It's the health leads tool. So the health leads tool is what the community decided we were agnostic and presented them with a series of options. And then we instantiated the, the questions in the health lead tool in our uh, closed loop referral platform. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap up and move on? Great, Dr. Ryder, again, thank you for your time today. Really appreciated your presentation. Great. My pleasure. Uh, we're gonna go ahead. Uh, our next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Robert Phillips from the Center for Professionalism and Value in Healthcare and the American Board of Family Medicine Foundation. Dr. Phillips. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. So I, I wanna talk about social risk and equity and how we use data to help funnel funding to the right places so that uh, Dr. Ryder's uh, conundrum of not having resources uh, as, a, as a problem up front for doing screening isn't there. And this is based on a health affairs blog that we produced in June that came out of a workshop with federal stakeholders and other stakeholders in January and will be part of an ongoing effort with those federal stakeholders to get to a policy. And all of this is responsive to the 2014 Impact Act, which directed HHS to answer the question whether 
and how we should adjust payments for social risk. Next slide, please. So right now, as Dr. Ryder alluded to, we're not doing a very good job of capturing social determinants of health at, in, at the point of care and clinical care. So right now it's, it's less than 4% of, of Z codes are, are being captured. Um, Medicare, Medicare um, Advantage programs or Medicaid Advantage programs are capturing at best, at least in 38 states where it's a requirement, but only one of them has adjusted payments based on that. And as Dr. Ryder said, practices are really not equipped or funded to manage social need. So we feel that we really need to lower the burden of screening. We need to, to put resources adequately to meet needs where they're most needed, and we need to reduce the capacity for gaming. Next slide, please. So the United Kingdom and New Zealand have figured this out on a big data scale. Uh, they measure social risk for all down to very small geographies and they measure, then they measure social need for each. So it's assessing risk, assigning payment, and then getting down to the individual patient needs or community's needs and, and using those, those allocated funds to meet those needs. Next slide, please. In the UK, it's the English index of multiple deprivation uh, where they adjust for social services payments and for clinical payments. It is a, it is a index, so it's a, a handful of social determinants weighted based on their impact on outcomes. And then those are used uh, to develop a, a payment scheme assigned to the index and the geography. So you're getting down to very small geographies where you're using that ecologic measure of risk and assigning it to people. Next, please because they've, they've shown that the, the worst quintiles of deprivation, that's the Q5 bottom bars, um, actually, sorry, Q1 in the English deprivation index, the top one, have higher expenses uh, despite having lower life expectancy. And so the, the, there is a, a relationship between cost and utilization and deprivation. Next, please. And they had a they had a schema. They they wanted to have universally available validated data at the base of their measure of risk. They wanted to reflect the underlying social and medical needs in a locality. They wanted it to be independent of previous spending, so it wasn't anchored in some history of, of cost. They wanted it to be scientifically coherent and plausible, feasible, so that there was low burden and low administrative cost. They wanted to reduce the ability to for manipulation or fraud or gaming as we often call it. They wanted to encourage the efficient delivery of services and keep it free from perverse incentives. They wanted to be transparent, parsimonious, so that there's a short list of social determinants driving it. And they really wanted it to reflect their policy intentions, which is critical. Next slide. Because their initial criteria were to reallocate national health service budgets uh, to secure equal opportunity for access for those at equal risk. But uh, uh, in 2001, they shifted, if we could, one more time, advance one more time, yeah, to contribute to the reduction in avoidable health inequities. So they really shifted to trying to reduce the equity gap in health outcomes and in mortality across the country, which was an important pivot uh, for how they allocate their resources. Next, please. How they, so the mechanism of delivering the funding is prescribed. How those funds are then distributed uh, is, is a policy judgment. It's not evidence driven, but it's trying to allocate the funding uh, across the sectors that need it in order to, to try and address inequities. But one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that there's almost a, a tenfold higher payment adjustment for areas with the worst um, mortality rates compared to those with the lowest. It's, so that's almost an exponential scale in terms of the payment adjustments made across the deprivation indices. Next, please. New Zealand did something very similar with their socioeconomic deprivation indices or the New Zealand Deprivation Index. Next, please. So also on a, on a five quintile scale, theirs is reverse. Uh, quintile one is the least deprived, quintile five the most. And looking at the North Island on the left or the South Island on the right, um, 
the, the mesh blocks that these are assigned to, again, are quite small, trying to increase the correlation between risk and, the, and a person's experience. Next, please. And again, seeing also a significant shift in the funding so that, that um, you know, for five to nine-year-olds at in quintile one, compared to those above 80 in um, quintile five, you see an almost tenfold difference in the per person funding. Next, please. Now we have some of the similar capacity in the United States. We have the area deprivation index that Amy Kind at University of Wisconsin developed. Next slide. Where you're measuring neighborhood disadvantage at very at, at census tract level, we have it for every census tract in the U.S. and Puerto Rico. Uh, they have been incorporated into predictive analytics and demonstrated to be related to a number of different health outcomes and cost and utilization. Um, it is privacy compliant because you're dealing with geographic areas, and it has a very strong track record. Um, she's had more than fifty million dollars of NIH funding looking at everything from how this relates to mortality to dementia. It's translatable uh, because you can use it to drive action at the person level, or you can aggregate up to community and, and look at community interventions where it's needed. And yet this index is, is fairly underutilized, even though it's, it's showed such great application. Next, please. It was initially developed by HRSA, but in, uh, in the mid 2000s, she actually updated it using census data um, and American Community Service data, uh, Survey data to develop their indices. And again, adjusting the index and how each of the elements are weighted based on their predictive capacity for a number of outcomes. And again, census tract looking down uh, at areas that capture about 1,500 people on average. Next, please. We did a similar thing in creating the social deprivation index a few years before, and it's no, um, no coincidence that the SDI and the ADI are extremely highly correlated because they use the same empiric process of, of, of relating social determinants back to outcomes and then deriving an index from them. Next, please. One of the things that we, we hope to accomplish with this is not only coming up with a policy for payment, but of being able to align that with what clinicians are using. Um, we, also, we actually developed something we call FATE, or the Population Health Assessment Engine, that uses a similar process to help clinics um, identify patients at high risk based on where they live, and also to be able to assess their communities for uh, community-based interventions. All of this in the hopes that if funds flow based on their patient population, they have a mechanism to use those more effectively. Next, please. So FATE uses the clinic's EHR data and the community data to map their service area. It tells them what geography they take care of. Our own research shows us that most clinicians overestimate their service area by 100%. Um, so it's important to really drill down and be able to understand who you're caring for. We've we've labeled the social deprivation index a community vital sign. And like most vital signs, the idea is it identifies a patient with, with risk. And then you're supposed to use that as a, a, a way into asking them about their particular problems or needs and addressing them. And uh, the Oregon Community Health Information Network, or OCHIN, has uh, implemented this in their 20 states, 27 state um, network and, and looked at different outcomes related to it. We've used it in my own practice in the third wealthiest county in the country, Fairfax, Virginia, to demonstrate significant differences in quality across our patient, um, our patients based on their community vital sign. And also we've, been, we've embedded Aunt Bertha so that you have um, the ability to find community-based organizations that might partner either for this patient on a particular need or this patient population who have a shared need. And again, we want to align any adjusted payment opportunities with tools to identify patients or communities with social needs. Next, please. So just to show you, you know, based on a clinic in Maryland, we can identify um, their service area outlined in red, and then they have presented them underneath that, the social deprivation index, the score for the community that lives there. When we break it down and in, in the highlighted census tract in purple, their community vital sign is 68, kind of putting them in, in the top one third of risk, 
And then we show them the other social determinants that make up that risk so that they can start to assess, you know, what this person may be experiencing. But again, not taking away from the need to ask the patient if they have social needs. Next, please. Massachusetts is the only state that's, that has used an ecologic measure of risk uh, for adjusting Medicaid managed care payments. They use the neighborhood stress score. Can you go to the next slide, please. It is actually a hybrid measure. So it uses individual level measures, um, most heavily severe mental illness. And then they use a, a neighborhood stress score that uses an array of social determinants that um, are created, that are aggregated into an index. And that combination of personal with neighborhood become the mechanism for adjusting their payments. Next, please. So again, our, our goal is, is to try and help this policy conundrum we're stuck in about whether and how we should adjust payments based on social risk. Uh, we think we should be adjusting uh, based on social determinants or an index constructed from them. And it should really aim to resolve the patient's specific, specific social needs as well as supporting community interventions. And we think the degree of adjustment should be proportional to the area disadvantaged and designed to address social needs and not just reflective of usual related healthcare costs. Uh, we like the geographic opportunity um, and using as small a geography as possible so that the association is, is very close to the person level. And it, it should be created based on patient and population outcomes so that the, the measure you're using you know is associated with things you would like to avoid or improve. And it needs to be sustainable, and it's, it's why we actually, with Stanford University and the Census Bureau, um, have forged a new relationship to try and improve on these indices and to potentially create a, a steward within the government for producing the measure uh, over time. And we think the policy should reduce the burden for providers and for payers and for states and reduce inequities between the states and, and the current process, which is a self-nomination process that I am concerned that some states will never enter into and will only widen the inequities that we see between states and health outcomes. And we think funders should predefine the goals of reduced total costs and improved patient health outcomes at the outset and use those to not only titrate funding, but also to, to create accountability for how the funds are used and what they're producing. We don't think they should be simply looking for cost offsets that don't align with accountability, but, but really should be looking to address the social needs that underlie the inequities. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Um, questions from the committee? Yeah, I have, this is Angelo again. I have a question. So, so uh, fascinating presentation. Just really enjoyed it and just love what you're doing. Do you use some of that uh, physician uh, practice area to assign community health workers? Do you use community health workers and how do you use this data to assign those? Angelo, it's a fantastic question. And, and absolutely, that is the goal um, is to be able to, to assign community health workers. And, and like I said, in our own practice, uh, the clinicians overestimated their service area by 100%. So we need more specificity in how we assign those community health workers to go out and work in the community. Um, we had a, a residency practice in Lawrence, Massachusetts, use the tool not only to define their service area, but they cut their data first, looking at their patients who they already screened for food insecurity. And so the geography was not just their clinical service area, it was our clinical service area for the population with food insecurity. And they used that to create um, mo mobile food pantries. And they could direct them specifically where to go to try and, and meet that specific neighborhood need. So yes, the targeting I think is a, a strong use for this. Great. Any other questions for Dr. Phillips before we move on to the next presenter? All right. Thank you, Dr. Phillips, for your presentation. Very helpful. Um, we now have Tony Ann Richard, who joins us from the Healthcare Collaborative of Rural Missouri. Tony Ann? Good morning. 
It's been so great to listen to all of the presentations today. I feel honored to speak with you all. I, my presentation is a little bit different as we are um, not a research organization. Um, and our, we do, while we do some research and development type of work uh, with third parties, what I'm really going to talk with you about today is um, how we have implemented some of these programs within our organization. So a little bit about who we are and uh, what we do. We are a, a vertically integrated rural health network. And um, we started in as an organization in 2004, uh, forming a board of directors. We then um, as, uh, became a, a nonprofit in 2006. I've been with the organization since 2007. Um, I like to tell people that we were doing uh, social care and social determinants of health before um, the cool kids uh, were doing social determinants of health. Uh, so in this rural health network space, what we did was we brought together uh, people in our service area, which at the time was about 35,000 was our population of one county. Um, brought together uh, people who wanted to solve some problems around provider recruitment, uh, oral health care for those uh, who do not have insurance or children with Medicaid. Uh, we are located in West Central Missouri, uh, which is a desert for um, behavioral health, primary care, and oral health services. And even though we're about 40 minutes outside of the Kansas City metropolitan area, uh, we were not able to do um, a we were not able to recruit and retain providers in, in the service area. Um, we were always rural focused um, and we've always been very culturally sensitive to, to what makes rural communities different um, than our urban counterparts. So you can go to the next slide, please. A little bit about our mission is to cultivate partnerships within within our communities to meet the needs of underserved populations. And uh, we don't we don't do this by uh, building our organization stronger, but by building the partners that we work with stronger. And so um, we we have some school based work that we do that's been very instrumental in our social care, social determinants of health work. Um, we also have brought in uh, we have a, a social service. Uh, network of people that we bring together to meet um, on a monthly basis that help develop strategic planning uh, for our organization to carry out to meet the needs that are unmet within those social uh, service organizations. We also have a larger network of membership that help drive our strategy and implementation uh, around services, uh, social, social services, as well as our direct clinical services. Uh, in 2013, uh, we opened our first FQHC. Uh, we are now, um, we have five locations, uh, three mobile units, and several school-based and nursing home access points. And so we've experienced extreme amounts of, of growth, um, but, but we were able to do a lot of that because of the, the drivers behind the social needs in our community. Next slide, please. We knew that what was important around social determinants of health was making sure that we never compromised um, quality health care um, and focusing on wellness. And so uh, I loved what Jacob mentioned earlier about putting doctors out of business. Those are conversations we've been having for a long time. Uh, we are now getting our physicians to have that same conversation about uh, what does that mean? Does that turn us in, turn physicians into uh, more of a wellness seat in our communities? And, and what are we doing to make sure that um, people are raising their children and caring for the elderly in ways that um, help us to live longer and help us to live in more healthy ways. Also, um, focusing on policy, uh, making sure that we keep social, social issues at the top of our policy initiatives. And so I'm going to talk here in a minute about how uh, we've moved that into uh, the development of, and implementation of community health workers within the clinical setting as well. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we know that we are we are not large enough. Uh, we're an organization now of about 110 staff. 80% uh, of those employees are clinical. Um, the other 20% of our staff are community-based staff. Of those community-based uh, staff, most of them are community health workers. And our community health worker program has um, soared and failed and soared and failed because of this uh, kind of ever-moving target 
of, of what we want our social programs to look like, and more importantly, what our communities and what our hospital partners, what our clinic partners, um, and what our community based partners need for us to do around community health workers. Um, we use the social, um, I'm sorry, the prepare tool. Uh, somebody mentioned the prepare tool earlier. There's a love hate relationship with prepare because we are a federally qualified health center. Um, it's data that we use to capture within our electronic health record um, and then is used to tag our community health workers into uh, making sure that those social issues are addressed in uh, within a specific time frame. Uh, so that is the tool that we use that we use. Um, our community health workers, we have some that are clinic based and we have some that are community based. We have uh, tried several different models. We've tried a general community health worker that floats in and out of the clinic. That did not work well for us, uh, really did not work well for our licensed providers. Um, at the same time, we were also adding um, social workers into our care teams and uh, that was new space for us. And so trying to define the work of a community health worker, making sure that they weren't crossing over into um, social worker space uh, really, really became challenging. And so uh, we split those roles. Uh, we, we looked for different ways on how to recruit and retain those individuals. And we're, we're looking at a model now to drive that down um, even one step further into finding um, content area expert um, community health workers. So it's really important for us that our community health workers look, feel, um, talk, and act like the patients that they serve. And so um, looking at whether some community health workers are focused on transportation, some work focused on food access, some focused on housing, uh, making sure that we have those uh, specific content areas available to provide support to our staff. Um, one example of this uh, area is, or one of the examples of how we're utilizing these community health workers is through a community health worker echo through the University of Missouri um, telemedicine network. It's excellent. If you, I'm sure you have echoes in your community um, within some of your partners, I would really encourage you to look at the community health worker echo, uh, bringing some major issues to light getting community health workers together to solve larger systematic problems has been um, really critical for us. We recently had a 90 year old patient um, who has been um, a victim of fraud. And because of some other services within our community that have had to shut down um, due to the impact of COVID, uh, our community health workers have had to get into this uh, financial wellness space for some of our patients. And uh, we were able to present this significant issue around um, elder fraud and what we can do to, to address it um, on this ECHO. We were um, able to get expert help from law enforcement, um, some legal advice, and then some follow-up action as well. So the community health worker ECHO has been really critical for us. Next slide, please. Uh, taking a look at future models of care, um, I would some recommendations that I can make based on um, our experience in this space is bringing those CFOs in early. Uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, we as a community health organization, um, federally qualified health center, we get really excited about the important work that needs to be done um, at the community level, um, boots on the ground work that we need that we need to do, we're ready to implement, we bring the finance um, leader to the table and uh, you know they throw their hands up, hold up, wait a minute, we've got to talk about what is this cost, what, what are we going to bring in, um, and how are we evaluating costs based on um, based on the patients. And it's it's not just about dollars and cents, you know, it's it's about um, livelihood, uh, safety, security, those types of things as well. And we think it's important to advocate with our um, with our health plans, uh, with Medicaid, about paying for what's right, um, paying for what's helping to keep people uh, out of the hospital unnecessarily, um, out of overutilization of clinical space um, unnecessarily. So somebody mentioned earlier annual wellness visits for our aging population. That's that's a great captured uh, place for us to be as an FQHC because uh, ninety five percent of our patients are experiencing some sort of vulnerability, uh, we really can maximize that prepare tool 
uh, one on one um, coaching with our community health workers and then they, they follow that process as well. Um, I will also say that getting paid for enabling services kind of as a benchmark that we have used as an organization is uh, that 10% of all of our patients are assigned a community health worker to ensure that enabling services are offered um, for issues that are identified in that prepare tool assessment. Also pairing a provider with a CHW um, community health worker or a social worker or some of our peer recovery coaches, which are working in the, the space of addiction and recovery um, was really challenging identifying um, roles and responsibilities, um, expectations, boundaries, and communication. So how can we take those experiences and um, go to uh, take a collective strategy um, and a, a, a performance measures to our health plans, to our funders, um, development officers, et cetera, in order um, to develop payment strategies that make sense to help support these positions that are non-billable within our space. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Collaboration takes time. This is just a quick snippet of what our organization looked like before we implemented um, clinical services. Uh, the clinical services, the FQHC model is the economic engine of what we do. The network is the heartbeat of our organization. It really drives the mission, vision, and values work uh, that we're doing within our community. And um, finding that right provider champion was really important. Uh, we tried a couple uh, different different providers who thought that they wanted to take the lead on this initiative and it became very clear that um, the risk assessment tools and then the risk to that to that licensed provider by capturing some of these social issues within an electronic health record just became too much um, the being able to address all of the the red flags and the screening issue uh, was just not a good use of use of the provider's time not to mention the documentation um, follow up and closing of the loop of all of those patients was really important. Uh, we found that it was also um, time for us to find the right people to connect with others. And so maximizing our community partners, uh, that could be our social service agencies, that could be network members, um, it could be a um, myriad of people that have just volunteered and gotten involved with our organization. Sometimes it's assigning uh, patients or patient populations specifically um, to individuals within our network. Um, Migrant Farm Workers is a, a great example of that. Uh, we found some champions around the Migrant Farm Workers space. And so directing patients um, to different teams within our organization has been very helpful. A referral looping, I've heard mention of referral looping before. It used to be that um, nurses were uh, really the only people that touched that referral looping um, from a quality metric perspective. Uh, the physicians and nurse practitioners, um, dentists, hygienists, psychiatrists, et cetera, were involved in that, but was, it was a nurse-driven model. Still a nurse-driven model. Um, our nurses are ultimately responsible for it. However, our peer recovery coaches um, and community health workers are getting involved in those conversations. They're actually working um, in tandem with the EMR through some uh, platforms that we've used through integration to capture um, some of those additional conversations, especially when we have to go to bat for a patient for um, services that need to be covered. I'm gonna apologize right now. I do live, I do work in a rural area and a train's getting ready to go by. So in um, you know, true fashion, it's going by right now. Um, next slide, please. So um, how, how do we take our information and develop our areas of consideration? Oh, oh sorry. Um, areas of consideration. So we use the um, IHI model, uh, PDSA. Uh, for health improvement, uh, we use it a lot. We use it in um, our clinical performances. We use it in our community-based performances. We also use it in how we hire, uh, how we do operational implementation. Um, and so, return on and our return on investment strategies also went through um, the PDSA model, which is Plan Do Study Act. It's a continual cycle of improvement. Um, which is why the need to bring those financial leaders in early uh, really helps you from going. Um, helps you continue to go through that model as opposed to hitting those financial uh, roadblocks and having to start over. 
Um, a lot of our feedback in terms of what we're doing right now is anecdotal. It's conversations um, with emergency room physicians, it's conversations with uh, nursing homes, um, partners that we uh, work with on the clinical space and in the community health space. Uh, we're working to move that into a more return on investment uh, model, looking at some of those indicators of, of how that how that can continue to improve. Um, last slide, please. So what's next? Um, some of the things that we're involving our community health staff in over the next uh, 12 months is uh, emergency room discharge planning uh, with five of our hospitals that are within our service area or adjacent to our service area. Um, also so, um, setting some um, new programs and resources out there for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, we have a very small amount of shelters um, in our community. Uh, we have even less short term housing options for people. Um, and so really taking a look at that special population to determine if we have um, moved the needle in terms of meeting their needs. Also making the technology work for us. Uh, we have significant broadband issues um, and also making our electronic health work record work in a way that allows our community health workers um, uh, peer recovery coaches, coaches and support staff in ways of engaging uh, in these conversations in the electronic health record space that doesn't that doesn't um, push a liability over to our licensed providers and then taking these plans um, over to the health plans as well. So we have great support for Medicaid in Missouri around the work that we do with community health workers and um, social determinants of health. A lot of that goes through our primary care association. Um, those contracts uh, work through Missouri Medicaid through the primary care association down to the community um, community health centers. Um, I feel like we've done a really good job of parlaying that into uh, resources for our network members, which do include our hospitals, um, clinics, and other social partners. And I talked really quick um, to get through that. That's all. Great, Tony Ann. Thank you very much. And we appreciate the train. That was, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether that was planned or not, but that nope. was lovely. No, I, I prayed it wouldn't come through, and here it is. <laughs> yeah, you know. well, they're, they're, they do try to stay on time. So, yeah. speaking of that, do we have questions from um, the committee? All right. Uh, Tony Ann, again, thank you so much. Um, the last, the last uh, presenter for the listening session today is Dr. Michael Hockman. Dr. Hockman, the floor is yours. Hey everyone, thank you very much. It's a real honor to uh, be able to present here today and especially after all those uh, presentations we've heard, amazing the good work that people are doing in this space uh, around the country. So uh, I'm a general internist, a primary care doctor I'm going to tell you about a new medical group that we are developing to focus on care for patients experiencing homelessness, uh, initially in Southern California, although potentially we hope to expand in, in the future. Um, the group is called Healthcare in Action, and we are funded by SCAN Health Plan. And uh, next, next slide, please. So I'll give you a little bit of a background about the challenge and why we're jumping into this space and uh, tell you a little bit about our model of care. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the payment implications and feel free to jump in at any point if you do have questions. Next slide, please. So just a little background about SCAN, which is again funding this initiative. It is a nonprofit Medicare Advantage plan. It was founded in 1977. Uh, initially as a uh, cooperative uh, uh, health care plan. Uh, it became a Medicare Advantage plan in, in the 90s. Uh, SCAN's very proud of uh, its 4.5 star rating with CMS the last several years. Uh, it is the second largest nonprofit independent Medicare Advantage plan in California with 220,000 members, about 15,000 duels in there, and it's actually the third largest uh, in the nation as well, independence, nonprofits, plan. Next slide, please. So um, 
you all know this, um, but it is not easy to be a patient experiencing homelessness. Uh, it's not easy, anyone uh, right now, to, to be a patient in, in primary care. It's cumbersome enough getting appointments and getting someone to respond to your phone calls, but let alone try trying to be homeless and patients who are homeless report just very high rates of frustration, uh, getting to appointments, there's transportation barriers, there's access barriers and, and so forth that, that really interfere. And then on the provider side, uh, it is not easy to care for patients experiencing homelessness who may not have uh, telephones, um, who may have high uh, no-show rates. Uh, you know, I can speak from personal experience being at a county clinic and someone who's homeless uh, comes in at four o'clock on a Friday and you really want to help them. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, oh gosh, here comes two hours and you know, I'm going to be out late and everyone else is going to be running late today. So next, next slide. And, and just to acknowledge that there's also a big disparities angle here. I used to uh, be the health deputy for Mark Ridley Thomas, who was the LA County Board of Supervisor member here in Los Angeles, who has been really the local champion of this issue. He got a Measure H uh, passed, which is a legislation to provide funding for supportive housing in, in Los Angeles. And he always used to say, homelessness impacts every racial and ethnic group. It affects men, women, children, those of different sexual orientations, but it disproportionately affects those groups that have historically faced discrimination in the US. So we really do think that there is an equity angle to this uh, work that we're doing. Next slide. So I mentioned the challenges. Uh, simply put, the existing medical infrastructure, doctors' offices, are not well suited to care for patients experiencing homelessness. And we've become very interested in the street medicine model of care. Uh, I've had some experience in working with the USC street medicine team. Uh, and also there are a number of other groups that are doing this, community health centers like Venice Family Clinic, there's about half a dozen that I'm aware of in LA alone, and I know many others uh, popping up around the nation. The idea here is to do away with the standard doctor's office and to have uh, clinicians go out to see patients where they are uh, in the streets and encampments and shelters under underpasses, follow them longitudinally in uh, hospitals and other facilities where they may end up. These programs have been associated with very high rates of patient experience, uh, improved disease control for mental health and substance use disorders, um, and uh, you know they're, they're basically a win all, all around. The only problem with these programs is that they do rely on charitable funding. We certainly are not aware of any self-sustaining street medicine model, and you'll understand why as we talk about the model going forward. Next slide, please. So what our vision is, is to take this street medicine model uh, that works so well for patients and clinicians, to put it in a, in a managed care framework and to create a sustainable healthcare model for homeless uh, adults. And we're gonna be structured as a nonprofit, value-based payer agnostic medical groups. So although we're being funded by SCAN, we're gonna see patients from any health plan. And we're actually looking for other health plan funders at the moment to help us with our startup costs. Uh, startup costs. We are gonna provide full scope primary care services, which in this case is gonna necessarily require mental health and substance use treatment as, and social work um, services, as, as I'll mention. And I should say, we are targeting a launch of January 1st, uh, 2022. Next slide. So the scope of services that we're providing are gonna be full scope primary care that would be expected of any other a delegated primary care provider and a managed care arrangement. We'll also provide clinical care management services for chronic diseases, and in this case, mental health and substance use conditions will probably be the most common of those. Uh, we're also gonna provide uh, ambulatory mental health and substance use services. Our model is not to have psychiatrists be out there with our team, but rather to have psychiatrists consulting, providing case conferences, uh, to be able to do televisits, um, in the field if necessary. So if our primary care clinicians need support, um, because we know that if we refer a patient to a psychiatrist's office, the chance that they're gonna get there uh, is, is low. Um, so we really provide, uh, wanna empower our primary care clinicians to provide this, these services directly. We're also gonna provide the wraparound services, the care management, the social work, transportation. So if a patient does need to go see a specialist, 
one of our community health workers or peer navigators would accompany them maybe in a lift uh, vehicle to that appointment. But the idea is to provide as much as possible point of care so that we don't need to transport um, patients unnecessarily. And we're going to follow patients longitudinally uh, if they do get admitted to the hospital. Because they are managed care members, we're going to get ADT alerts uh, and work closely with the health plan care management team so we can track them as they go to hospitals and other uh, facilities and coordinate those uh, uh, transitions. In the future, we do hope to move to professional risk, uh, and, and this gets to some of the payment implications I'm going to talk about shortly. Next slide. So this is what the team uh, would look like. We are hiring right now nurse practitioner and physician assistants who are going to, to really be the owners of these uh, teams. They are going to be the, the main primary care uh, clinician. They're going to be coupled with uh, three peer navigators. We're hiring individuals with lived experience with homelessness. Our, our lead navigator, for example, uh, was homeless for several years, was in skid row, had substance use challenges, overcame those. And for eight years, he's been uh, housed. He's doing great now. And uh, he's been working on skid row as a care manager, and we're hiring him and you know, to impart the, the skills that he learns to, to others. And you know, needless to say, uh, uh, the patients just listen to him and he has a resonance that, that uh, just the rest of us don't, don't have because of that personal experience that he's had. And then we're also gonna have a social worker be part of the team. We are not trying to recreate the housing systems uh, in LA because there are uh, very effective coordinated entry systems, but rather we're trying to understand those processes to be able to advocate for our patients and frankly, hold our patients hand as they go through the system because it is a very complex process. But if we have someone to help them, uh, we think the success rate is gonna be a lot higher. So I mentioned before that the cost of a street medicine model is a lot more expensive than a standard primary care practice. And I think this number says it right here. The panel size that we're targeting is about 125 patients per primary care clinician. The average private practice panel size is 2,300 patients or so. So this is gonna be an order of magnitude more expensive than a standard primary care model. So the question is how do we make this work from a business perspective? Next slide. And I'll get to the business model very shortly, just a little more details about what uh, we're, we're going to do. So first, uh, you know, we're really aiming to get managed care perspective payments so that we don't have to worry about day-to-day uh, -day fee for service billing. Uh, we want to provide all-inclusive primary care, as I mentioned, minimizing referrals. We are uh, partnering, um, um, we'll publicly say this, but I'll just mention that American Well, the um, the uh, telehealth provider is going to be working with us and uh, may even be donating some mental health and substance use uh, televisits for our patients. And again, the idea is that our peer navigator would be with the patient in the streets and the encampments and the telehealth provider would come in and, and provide that guidance. So we can do things like uh, initiate long acting uh, injectable uh, antipsychotic medications, um, substance use treatments, all our providers are going to be Suboxone uh, certified, but of course, you know, sometimes complex issues come up where we do need a, a specialist perspective there. 24-7 um, access, how are we going to provide 24-7 access to our patients so that they actually call us? We're planning to give uh, cell phones with data plans to patients, and um, one of the biggest challenges patients do have in the field is charging uh, those. So uh, th there's, there's these uh, solar chargers so that the patient can get their cell phones charged, and, and so that if they have an issue at 7, 8 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, they can actually, we're going to really try to encourage them to call us rather than going to the emergency room or even partnering with an organization that would be able to send EMTs out to the, uh, the field at all hours to do a crisis response. So really trying hard on the ER and hospital avoidance. Uh, urgent care services on the streets were being set up so that we can provide uh, IV fluids, IV diuretics, IV antibiotics to do wound care, drain abscesses and so forth. Medication management, we're going to actually deliver medications to patients because I know in my county clinic, if I prescribe a blood pressure medication, the chance the patient's going to go to CVS and get that's pretty low. So we'll actually pick up the medications for the patient, uh, give it to them. And in certain cases, we would even do directly observed therapy if we know that preventing an ER visit depends on uh, the patient taking their 
their medications, whether those be cardiac medications or mental health medications, we're actually going to observe them, remind them, call them, and so forth. It's very high touch. As I mentioned before, behavioral health is going to be built in. Uh, social work is going to be built into the model, and longitudinally, we're going to be following patients in various facilities. So next slide. So the, the business models to, to support this. Um, to, to get an understanding, the average, and this is this is the statistic for SCAN members. SCAN is a Medicare Advantage plan, so we only have Medicare patients, including duals. So this wouldn't necessarily apply to a homeless patient who is just straight Medicaid. I would imagine it would be lower than this. But for the SCAN members, duly eligible patients experiencing homelessness, the average cost of care is sixty thousand uh, dollars uh, per year. We expect that the cost of the street medicine model is going to be about $10,000 per year per patient, a lot higher than a standard um, primary care capitation arrangement, but again, so is the cost, total cost of care uh, for this population. And I'll just mention that um, SCAN gets about $10,000, I'm sorry, $24,000 per patient per year from CMS based on the HCC RAP uh, system. So, so SCAN loses. $35,000 per member per year on these patients. Next slide. So the first business model, I mentioned that the average cost of care is about $60,000. Based on some um, suggestive studies that we've seen, we're hopeful that we're going to be able to reduce total cost of care by about $25,000 uh, with ER and hospital avoidance. So if we're able to do that, it bumps down scans cost from $60,000 to $45,000. That creates some shared savings. If we could get seven and a half thousand of that, uh, seventy five hundred of that, uh, and scan keeps seventy five hundred plus the standard capitation that gets us to about the ten thousand that we need to sustain the uh, the model, and scan comes out. The health plan comes out uh, ahead. Um, I will acknowledge that um, we're hopeful we can achieve this, the twenty five percent reduction in ER and hospital utilization, but. We're not aware of rigorous studies that have shown this, so we're applying for grant funding to see if we can demonstrate it. There are some encouraging studies, but these have been pre-post studies. There may be regression to the mean and other uh, challenges, so I don't want to in any way suggest that, uh, that it's well established that we're going to be able to actually achieve this, but that's, that's what our goal is to do. Next slide. The other potential business model that could work is if we were able to uh, to get uh, enhanced payment for the social determinants of health. And I think it fits in very nicely with what Dr. Phillips was saying, that if there could be an adjustment factor for the fact that uh, patients who are homeless um, do cost more than, than the HCC RAF system suggests. Again, for SCAN, $24,000 Medicare pays SCAN, but the actual cost is $60,000. We anticipate that the adjustment factor would need to be about 1.77. Um, we're going to get some reductions just from simply getting them into managed care arrangements. Um, but, but at the end of the day, it's still going to be more costly. Um, we also would need uh, enhanced funding for health-related social services, so things like paying for bridge housing services, uh, care navigation that isn't part of standard uh, scope of services that a health plan would provide. Um, and then also some greater flexibility. And one of the big ways that I think it's important to have flexibility, you know, all these STAR measures are based on how many mammograms and colonoscopies we can do, how good a job we do of getting hemoglobin A1Cs under 8%. Well, these are lower priority issues for patients experiencing homelessness. And I think we do need to have some flexibility to, to reframe what the, what the quality measures are. Maybe it is... Um, uh, control of mental health conditions and substance use, self-reported substance use rates. And maybe it's things like what percentage of our patients are successfully able to be uh, enrolled in bridge housing um, that are not standardly part of the, the, uh, the STAR measures. So next slide. So let me stop there. That's a little bit about what we're doing and the business models that we're trying to negotiate to make it uh, sustainable. And I'd love to take any questions you might have. Great. Thanks, Dr. Hockman. Uh, Jay. Yeah, first, congratulations on a very noble effort. And, uh, and I totally hope you're successful. One question, how many SCAN members are actually homeless at this point in time? 
Yes, SCAN has about 350 members who are homeless. That's part of the reason we are going to open it up to other health plan members. It's just not, and that's 350 throughout California. It's about 200 in Los Angeles. So to achieve the economies of scale that we need, we're, we're looking for, and, and we're very close to getting some contracts with that other uh, local LA health plans to, to do this. And, and do you make any attempt to enroll uninsured patients in any type of program, specifically Medicaid, while you're out on the street? Yeah, uh, absolutely. We're, you know, I worked at the USC Street Medicine Program, and we come across patients who aren't, at the USC program, it was patients who are impaneled to the county, but we all the time are going to come around friends and neighbors of, of people, and, and we encourage them to, to get enrolled in, in Medicaid. For this to work, to be sustainable, uh, uh, we do need them to have a managed care program. Uh, otherwise, you know, uninsured patients, we're not going to be able to be reimbursed. Um, but we are prepared to deal with acute issues that do just, you know, obviously if someone comes up and they have an acute crisis and they're not part of your insurance program, we have an ethical responsibility to deal with it and then to encourage them to get enrolled. Now, I will say that some of the health plans are anxious about this because if they if we take a contract from a health plan and um, patient knows that they are enroll in that health plan, that we might be able to serve them, that that could lead to some adverse selection. Um, but I have to say that health plans have not prevented that from taking the leap, uh, at least based on the discussions we've had, that they're willing to still contract with us. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee before we wrap this session? All right. I want to thank all of you for sharing your experiences with us today. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground uh, during this session, thanks to your input. Um, we are going to take a break. Uh, we reconvene at 1.30 Eastern, 10.30 Pacific. Um, so we'll see you back for the subject matter expert panel um, at 1.30. Thank you. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.